Today we're starting with Unit 4 from the Edexcel specification. We're going to be learning about photosynthesis. First of all, we're going to be starting with the overall reaction of this process. We're going to look at the reactants, which are water and carbon dioxide. We also find what happens to the products, which are glucose and oxygen. Here is the equation of photosynthesis. In this equation, I would like to stress on two things. First of all, what happens to water here is known as photolysis. In the photolysis of water, light energy is used to split the water molecule into oxygen, which is a waste product, and hydrogen, which is used in the formation of glucose. On the other hand, both carbon and oxygen from carbon dioxide are used for the synthesis of glucose. This is really known here as the carbon fixation. Carbon dioxide is completely fixed into a molecule of glucose. This is the second part of the syllabus that we're gonna go over. In this part, we're gonna look at a process known as photophosphorylation. Photophosphorylation involves the use of light, photo part of the word, to phosphorylate a molecule of ADP. ADP is the form of ATP that has less energy. Using light energy, a phosphate group is attached to ADP here to form the higher energy molecule ATP. Since we are forming new bonds in this reaction, then this reaction is also known as a condensation reaction. A condensation reaction is any time you form a new bond by the removal of a water molecule. The opposite reaction occurs whenever energy is needed for the cell. In the case of active transport or any process that would require energy, ATP is hydrolyzed, that's the opposite of condensation, to form both ADP and release the energy required for this process. This slide shows the relationship between photosynthesis and respiration. Photosynthesis uses light energy for the making of glucose. The chemical energy stored in glucose is used for the making of plenty of ATPs. Those ATP molecules will now be used for the processes that occur inside the cell. Active transport, for instance, uses ATP to move materials across the cell membrane. You can see here how the energy from the sun has been converted into chemical energy in ATP. ATP is used rather than glucose in the cellular processes because ATP is much smaller, plus it is recyclable. It can always be recycled from ADP into ATP. To understand photosynthesis, you have to have a good knowledge of redox reactions. Redox reactions are the ones that involve both oxidation and reduction. Oxidation and reduction involve the loss and gain of hydrogen. In biology, we're only concerned about the hydrogen part of redox. When a molecule is oxidized, it basically loses a hydrogen, and this hydrogen is always given to another molecule that gets reduced. In photosynthesis, there is a molecule that is dedicated for these redox reactions. NADP is a coenzyme that helps to transport hydrogen from one molecule to another. The loss and gain of hydrogen does not occur by itself. It really requires the help of this coenzyme or the carrier molecule NADP. Just like ATP, NADP can also be recycled into two forms. There is the oxidized form, which is simply called NADP, and there is the reduced form, which can also be called NADPH. When molecule 1 loses its hydrogen to NADP, this means that molecule 1 got oxidized. NADPH will now donate its hydrogen to another molecule, we'll call it here molecule 2, so this M2 here will be reduced. And as you can see here, the NADP is now available to carry out another redox reaction. We are now going to look at the internal structure of the leaf and we'll study the different adaptations that leaves have. Leaves are thin, they are wide and flat, they have veins and there are plenty of stomata. Leaves are thin because this provides a short distance for diffusion of gases. 
gases diffuse much faster if the distance across the leaf is thinner. Being wide and flat means the leaf can take more light energy for the process of photosynthesis. Veins carry out two processes. Veins are to transport materials such as water. Veins also help to support the leaf, to keep the leaf in its right position to absorb more light. Finally, leaves have stomata. Stomata are air holes that allow gases to move in and out of the leaf. Carbon dioxide enters the leaf for photosynthesis while oxygen, which is a waste product of photosynthesis, diffuses out of the leaf. We are now going to look at the internal structure of the leaf. Most photosynthesis occurs at the middle part of the leaf where palisade cells are found. To a less extent, spongy mesophyll have fewer stomata than the palisade cells, but still plenty of photosynthesis occurs in spongy mesophyll. The other layers of the leaf are to facilitate the process of photosynthesis. So the upper part, which is made up of the waxy layer and the upper epidermis, let the light enter the palisade cells. The lower epidermis is the one where the stomata are found, so this is where the exchange of gases takes place. We are now going to look at the internal structure of the chloroplast. The chloroplast is more like a mini cell found within the larger plant cell. The chloroplast has a double membrane which allows gases to move in and out and it also has internal membranes. These internal membranes are known as the thylakoids. Thylakoid is where most chlorophyll is found and this is where the absorption of light is happening. As you can see here, the membranes of the chloroplast are permeable to gases, so they allow the entry of carbon dioxide into the leaf and oxygen to diffuse out. Here's another look at the chloroplast to study the internal structures in more details. So the thylakoids are stacks of membranes where chlorophyll is found. Every pack or stack of these thylakoids is known as the granum. There are also connections between these thylakoids. In the edic cell specification, these are known as the lamella. The stroma is a jelly-like material within the chloroplast. This is where carbon fixation takes place. As we've said earlier, the double membrane are to exchange materials between the chloroplast and a plant cell. We can divide the chloroplast into two main compartments or two locations. This is known as compartmentalization. Compartmentalization is to divide the organelle into two locations where two different functions take place. The two major locations in the chloroplast are the thylakoids and the stroma. The thylakoid is where light-dependent reactions take place. The thylakoid is where light is absorbed for the purpose of making ATPs. Stroma is where carbon fixation takes place. Carbon fixation is to turn a molecule of carbon dioxide into glucose molecules. We are now going to have an overview of the process of photosynthesis. At the beginning, light energy is absorbed by the chlorophyll which is found in the thylakoids. The light energy is used for the process of splitting a water molecule into oxygen and hydrogen. The hydrogen is carried by the hydrogen carrier NADP, which becomes reduced NADP. And this light energy is used for the making of ATP by the process of photophosphorylation. Both molecules are now going to be used for the process of carbon fixation. The carbon fixation takes place in the stroma where carbon dioxide is used for the making of glucose. Both ATP and NADPH are used in the carbon fixation but then they're going to have to be returned back to the thylakoid. ATP will be turned into ADP, while reduced NADP will become the oxidized form which is known as NADP. As you can see that both the light reactions and the light independent reactions are very interconnected. If light is missing, then both the light reactions and carbon fixations will stop. If carbon dioxide was also missing, then this will stop the recycling of NADP and ADP, and this will stop the light reactions.
In the next class, we're going to look at the photosynthetic pigments. We're going to watch how these pigments absorb light. So we're going to expose these pigments to UV light and see how they will respond. We're going to study the light-dependent reaction and how different pigments absorb different wavelengths of light. We're also going to do a simulation about the action spectrum practical. So we're going to expose the plant to different wavelengths and see how they respond to this. We're also going to uh, separate photosynthetic pigment using the chromatography method. Finally, we're going to look at the light-dependent reactions and how the plant makes ATP using light energy.